Mike, did you edit the exam? Let us go ahead and give ourselves started again. We are in the second part of session eight of 120C, 220C. We have been talking a lot about assignment one and the cool stuff people have been doing for that. We want to move you along, <coughs> pardon me, just a bit to uh, thinking about how we can start being, oh, even more controlling of uh, the things that we are experimentally uh, doing. <coughs> We're going to look at sort of the notion of creating patterns or having things in or out based upon different criteria, and then start talking about how we can evaluate things uh, just based on things like orientation to the sun. So we're going to start by basically looking at an example of creating some patterns. And in terms of creating the patterns, the big thing that we're going to start with is uh, just the whole notion that we can use code blocks to go through and create numeric strings okay, that have different patterns to them. Every other, every third, every fourth, whatever pattern it is you're trying to create, and just use a slightly different variation of it. We've often been saying zero to the last item, okay, then dot, dot, and pound sign the number of things to create between that, okay, and it subdivides things into a set number of points. This other variation of the code block series basically goes zero up to the number of items, and then the increment is the step along the way, the incremental value. So if I said 0 to 100 dot dot 2, it'd be 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, counting all the way up to 100. Okay. If I said 0 to 103, 0, 3, 6, 9, and go like that. Okay. So we're going to start by basically going through and creating some different patterns using a code block. Then we can either alter or remove elements using a couple of different functions. If we want to get some different items at an index, and most of our items are in lists, so we can grab every other one or grab every fourth one, we can get the items at that index, or we can even think about removing items at an index, so grabbing and removing every other one so that it isn't created or it just knocks it out. And we'll look at some specific examples of how we can do that. So if you can, Please go ahead and open up uh, example 8.1, and we'll take a look at that together. So 8.1 should be hanging out there on Canvas for you. Let us take a look. I'll say open. Where do I need to be? Let me know if for some reason it's not out there. I'll open up the wall O panels. In the wall O panels, this is a very boring wall O panels right now. You're looking at it from the top. We go ahead and look at it from the side or from a 3D view. Okay, so it looks like a little row of two by is it ten? That'd be nine. Okay. Panels right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Dynamo uh, graph that generated all this. So I'll say open and go to, let's go ahead and start ourselves out with, it's 8.1, I think there's a 1A in there. I just want to visit this really quickly because this is sort of an example of just a really common pattern that we use a lot. But I sort of, you know, did some things quickly, so it's a little few time-saving tips in here. At some level, I'm going to start out to make this wall by creating a series of lines and putting a lot of points along those lines that are going to represent the panels. So I just created a series of three different, like, uh, straight lines. There's a way to do that that is actually kind of very quick if you want to. That little point by coordinates function, which we like so much, actually allows you to feed in either individual numbers or you can feed it lists of numbers. And if you decide to cross products and things, you can go through and create whole grids of points. So what I'm doing here is I'm feeding in, I want to create a whole bunch of different points. They all have the same x value, which is zero. 
I have two different y values, 0 and 50. That's kind of sort of towards the front of the screen, y being going into the back of the screen there. So 0 and 50. And then I have three different heights, 0, 10, and 20. So I've got a whole like little 3D grid of points there. And that actually works. If you go through and feed in not just a single value, but that bracket, comma, next value, that's called list. And what we're doing here is really very much like just saying list create. I could have said list create and fed it that way, but it's kind of a shortcut way of doing it. So 0, 0, and 50, 0, 10, and 20. And that basically created, it's really, it's the end points. Actually, let me kind of be really clear about what it created. I'll take out those lines, okay? And I'll even <coughs> take out the next part over here, which is these points. So I can run that again. It's kind of leaving the points around. Yeah. Okay, so I really just want to have, it's uh, just six points, you'll see. Kind of pull this up a little bit. I have basically two rows. It's the uh, Y is three in each of those. Actually, there's more than that. That's actually it. It's just the two rows. It's the X and the Y's with the three different points right there. Oh, you can actually see them. I'm not sure if you can see it in the background there. Since I have that node highlighted, they're actually sort of showing up in blue. Right here, I'm not sure if you can see that. They're just a little bit different here. Those are the points that were created by that point by coordinates. Okay, I wanted to go through and basically just draw some lines between them, but in order to do that, I needed to do a little playing around with the list. What I wanted to do is really just get the start and the end points of those different lines. So what I was going to do is basically do a little getting item at the index. And as I think about getting the item at the index, I just needed to go through and make a small change. Let me pull the code block out of the way there for a second. You'll see that my list of points in the two different rows is kind of buried alive inside of another list. So that's a telltale sign you might need to do a little bit of flattening. So <coughs> I am going to flatten it. I'm going to flatten it by one level. And you'll see when I do that, I get just one less level of list. So now I have basically two different rows that have three different points in it, or actually it's two different columns here. That's okay. They have X and Y points in them. I am going to distinguish for you ever so slightly the difference between flatten and list flatten, because as you type in flatten, you'll get both. The difference is when I say list flatten, I get to go through and put in a degree of flattening, so the amount, so I can flatten out one layer or multiple layers. If I choose to just flatten a list without the list flattened, that's called flatten completely. It just gives you a single flat list, so it completely flattens. Okay, so just two things to watch out for. If you're flattening and you're wondering what the difference is between those two things, you get to choose the number of levels. You say list flatten or just flatten the whole thing. But in any case, I'm going to take that list. I'm going to basically get all the first items, which is these points in the first list. I'm going to get the second item, which is the points in this list. And I'm going to use those as starting and ending points to generate those three lines. So what that's doing is the first list is those three points. The second is those three points. And really what they are is, it's the three different x, y values. The first are at z0, the second are at z10, the third are at z20. So if I combine those two things together as lines from start to end, it creates those lines. So that whole thing in terms of just really defining some lines, kind of stash them away somewhere in your uh, bag of tricks as a really quick way of generating some different lines. If I want to do, oh, go ahead and have four lines there instead, I could just go ahead and say, let's do the third one at 30. Okay, and I'll get that there too. So, yeah, if I want to make it longer, I'm 
and you sort of just really quickly sort of change things like that. Okay. It all starts with just generating some lines. That part's okay. Just a common little block of code to kind of play with. <laughs> But I'm just going to keep on encouraging you to always think about kind of quicker ways to do it. Once I have those lines, I'm going to go through and just put some points along them. So I'm going to put 10 points along those lines. Okay, 0 to 10. Again, this is the original way we've been using the uh, code block where it's 0 to 1 and it creates those sort of values along the way. After I go through and put those lines on, I can put make some quads out of them. I'm going to make a more rectangular grids and flatten that. <coughs> That's all typically what we end up doing when we want to go through and divide a surface or divide some lines up into quads. You'll see the result of all that is I have oh this little like uh, rows and grids at different points. That's super. I'm now going to go through, actually now I'll take that back. This is actually just a list of points because I flattened it. It was rows and, grid, rows and columns over here. By flattening it, it just became a series of four different points independent of the rows. Then I'm going to make the adaptive components and place them on there. Okay, so that's so far, that, there's nothing a whole lot new there. That was just sort of a, a little code block uh, tidying things up just to make it a little bit quicker to do some of those things. But let me pause there for a second. Is that kind of making sense to people? Excellent. I have a question. Yes. Can you go back to the start point? Yes. What does that code block Okay. This line by start point end point, in this case, that's always going to take, if you feed it a bunch of points, it's going to take anything you feed it here is the starting of a line, anything you feed it here is the second at the ending of a line. If you have two lists, then it'll actually pair the first to the first, the second to the second, the third to the third. And how do you how do you tell it that you want four lines and four lines? Oh, in this case, it's going to form the four lines because there's four items as starting points and four items as ending points. Okay. okay. So just depending upon how many are in here, and watch out, it'll complain at you if you have a difference between the, there's three in one list and four in the other list. It'll say, hey, there's an unmatched item in here, which was why. When we were kind of joining things using list rest of items, we had to knock off the last one because you had an uneven list. Okay. No worries. Okay, so that part's that, but let's go ahead and get a little uh, more interesting about this. And here's the deal. If we think about trying to create a pattern, this list of items right over here, it's kind of like begging for a little bit of action. So let's think about this. Here's a list of all the different panels that are going to be created. It's a big, flat list. There's like, oh, I don't know, 40 panels in there or something like that. No, it's 3 times 9, I think. It's going to be 27 in there. Yep. OK, 0 to 26. So if, for example, we wanted to go through and, oh, let's go ahead and just going to grab every second panel or maybe knock out every other panel, either one. Okay, let's think how you can do that. You got to come up with a panel, as, yeah, uh, an indexing scheme that's going to grab those. And you see all of these different panels, all these different points that are going to create panels, they have like an indexing scheme to them, the zero, one, whatever. We can either grab the points that are feeding into the adaptive components, or I could even come over here and grab the adaptive components themselves. Again, they're an indexed list. So it sort of depends. If I want to sort of stop them from being created, I can go ahead and grab this list and pull some out. If I want to do something to the ones that are already created, I can do it over on this list. Either way, but I'm just going to come up with a pattern. So patterns are things like this. If you go through and say 0, dot, dot, OK, and I'm going to say just the number of items. Dot, dot. I say two, that's going to be the every other pattern. Okay? If I do by three, it'll be every third item. Four, it'll be every fourth item. We're just going to somehow grab those out of there. So somehow we need the number of items. So in terms of the number of items, what we can do is 
Actually, what I'm really going to do is number of items minus one because if it's an index of zero, blah, blah, blah. I, if I'm going to go knocking things out, I never will get the number of items. Super. Now, to get the number of items, does anyone know of a nice function you might have seen recently that allows you to count the items in a list? Hey, that's a good one. I like that. Okay, we will come over here, do a little bit of list counting. <coughs> so I can take that <coughs> fabulous list and count. I'm going to say there's 27 of them there. I'm going to say the number of items minus one. So it's going to go 0, 2, 4, all the way up to 26. It's not going to get to 27. So super. Now I've got a list of indexes, 0 through 26. I've got a list of panels over here, 0 to 26. I can do something to them. I can either get them and do something to them, or I can remove them. Either one. Either one will sort of work. Let's try, oh, doing some uh, removing. I'll come over here and say list remove item at index. So let's think about this. We are going to give it the full list, okay? And then we're going to tell it of that full list which items are the ones we want to remove. So if I grab the full list and I take out these indexes, okay, that will be the smaller list. Now, we might not see anything happening in Revit just yet because well, this has 0 to 27. Let's take a look at this list over here. This list over here just has 0 to 12. Okay, so it has half of them in there. The resulting list over here is the one I want to feed into Revit. So I'll come in and say, let's grab those points and send those over instead. And you'll see what happens over here in Revit land. It's kind of interesting. That is not what I would have expected. But, you know, hey, let's take a look. Oh, I think I know what's going on. Take care. Let us go ahead and remove those panels. I think what's going on is I have a bunch of the panels from the four, still kind of hanging around. Okay, so now, shade that up so you can see it. Okay. There's a little every other sort of pattern. Not too awfully bad. Yeah, the same technique. If I wanted to do every third, I could do something like that. Let's go to every third panel as opposed to every other. to run. Should be there. What's going on? Oh, enter. Click out of there. Evaluate. Okay. Every third panel did something like that. Every fourth panel. Yeah, just basically by removing panels from a pattern, we can have all sorts of interesting behaviors. Now, how this is marching up the wall is really just based on the notion of it's starting over in lower left, and then over here, that was a third, one, two, what is it? I expect that one, to, oh, maybe the end one's gone there. But it's just more, yeah, the offset really depends on really uh, how many things are in each row. So you might need to adjust that a little bit, or kind of take it row at a time which is something we can do too, in terms of removing them. So we can do things like removing items at index, okay? Or the other thing you could start thinking about doing is just getting those items at the index. So let's try this instead. Instead of removing the items at those index points, let's go ahead and get item at index instead. So for this, 
Let me go ahead and I'll say grab those guys. Oops, those are the indexes. <laughs> I'm going to take out this remove. And I will just plug in and create all of the items. But what I'm going to do is, in terms of changing them, so all the panels are back again, I'm going to go ahead and get the ones that are actually placed okay, and do something to them. So let's think about what we can do. Any votes? What can we do? We can change their thickness. We can change their color, something like that. Oh, On God likes the element override color and view. Okay. So if I wanted to go ahead and give them a special color, I'll take those elements. Then, oh, for a color, let me say ARGB or something like that. I always have to remember what this looks like. Here's my little color. So if I want to make something that is, oh, incredibly red, it should look like that. Hopefully that's red. OK, we can start applying or, oh, if we change the thickness of them. Very interesting patterns that sort of, you know, do colors in one variation and, you know, height changes in another variation. When you get or grab them, lots of things you could do. The other thing you might be able to do is let's see what sort of parameters are available here. This doesn't really have very many parameters, doesn't it? Well, that is kind of disappointing, but we can go through and fix that. Okay, I believe Andrew even did this as he was working. He took my little uh, seamless panel here. Let's see if we can edit that family. What we were thinking about is just really, oh, for this panel, if, for example, you want to be able to go through and you know, control the thickness of that panel, okay, we can add a parameter to it to do it. In this case, I'm choosing the top surface of the panel. You can see there's actually a little dimension over there. So if I click on that, which will make it available to assign a parameter to it, I can add a parameter, and I'll call that O panel thickness. And let that be, I'll let it be an instance parameter, so we could change it around and really do something quite interesting if we wanted to. Super. I'll load that back into my project. So now, all these different panels have some sort of parameter to it called panel thickness, so super. I could, instead of overriding the color in view, I could do element set parameter by name. That would work too. So if I wanted to go through and do uh, element set parameter by name. So I can take those parameters, or those elements, and if the panel height over here is the name of the variable, or the parameter, or panel thickness, okay, and for the value, oh, I'll just make them five. <coughs> Put some slider in there, I can compute something. They're looking kind of interesting. Okay. Another variable that some of us ran into by accident is you can choose one of these guys and flip is a variable. <laughs> so if you wanted to have some flip in and some flip out, even here, let's say we wanted to have every other one flip in and flip out. Let's see if we could do that. So I could say zero to, again, number of panels. I'll go by two. Oh, number of panels minus one. 
Okay, so I gotta count the number of guys out there. So I'm gonna do that list count again. I should get that stuff on the screen so people can see what I'm typing. So I can count those panels over there. <coughs> So what's going to happen is that's going to just give me the pattern. But now if I say list get the ones at these specific numbers at the 0, 2, 4, and 6 spaces, I'll again say list get item at index. And there's no huge rhyme or reason to what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of playing around, kind of coming up with different patterns. I can take that list of panels at that index. Actually, it may barf on me for just a moment because it's uh, got some weird things connected in strange ways. I've almost created a circular argument right here. Mm -hmm. I think that, did I? You can make a circle. Okay, so I'm going to take those in as my indices. I have my list as being those. And then for items coming out there, I don't want to override those colors. What I really want to do is override those elements. Okay, super. And over here, that was this list of elements. Okay, so what I want to do here is, oh, for these elements, those ones that are kind of currently every other one of those. A really kind of cool parameter is this. You can say, take the elements. <coughs> the parameter name that we're actually going to use is, and you have to look at it, what it is over here. It's flip. So you can say, flip it. Flip is kind of a good one. Flip just has sort of a true or false value to it. So in terms of that, I'm trying to think if one or zero will work too. I gotta remember. I'll try Boolean in there. We'll see which one it likes, whether it likes one and zero or true and false. So I'll change that to true and see if it does it. Okay. Oh, now this one over here, I think I had changed manually. That's why it was out there. So now every other one is flipped if you were counting across the bottom and coming up and there and all that stuff. Okay, so so a lot of stuff you can do there in terms of that. No problem there. Let's go ahead though and kind of think about a couple of things you can do. The other variation that is so useful to think about there is this whole notion of filtering or subdividing things in groups. So I can go through and kind of create these indices and create patterns, but we can go ahead and set up just a criterion, and then based upon whether things meet the criterion or don't meet the criterion, they're either in or out. Okay, and that's a really useful thing. So in terms of creating a list of Boolean values, you can use plus, or you can use a greater than, less than, equal, you're just sort of setting up some sort of comparison that's going to return true or true or false, okay? So let's kind of think about that and what we can do. Then we'll use this thing, filter by Boolean mask. But let's show you what it looks like. What I'm going to do is I have all this junk over here kind of hanging around. I'm just going to disconnect that so that really all my adaptive components, oops, let me regenerate them. <laughs> Otherwise, these will kind of stick around and confuse us. Okay, back to our plain wall. Okay, so let's think about some criterion we might use to go through changes. We could say that, for example, you know, if, oh, you know, what is it? 
Yeah, anything is above a certain value, so any panel that's above 15 or something like that, we want to go through and remove. Something like that. We can say that anything beyond a certain distance. We can choose any criteria we want to. It's just got to be something we can evaluate about the panel and then uh, go from there. Okay, so that sort of makes sense? Just anything we can sort of choose. You know, later on it could be things like, do you face the sun or do you not face the sun? Okay, but for right now, it could be just anything. So let's take our panels over here. Okay, our panels are actually made up of all these different points, so maybe I'll just go back to the points that define them. Okay, and let us do this. What do I want to do? The panel's there, no, the panel's there. I'm just trying to think about some criteria, and I can go ahead and pull out about it. Because uh, I want something I can get. I'm going to try this. So I don't want to get the first item there. I'm just trying to think of a way to do this. That's kind of good. I might be stuck for a good example right up hand because given what I have to work with, What I'm trying to think about is just how I can pull the Ys just of a single panel or something like that. But that's kind of buried alive in a lot of panel points. Well, let's see if we can make this work. How about within those, we want to get that there. I should have thought this through. What can I do about those points? Because if I want to say it's any of those points, let me just try something here. Grab the Ys of the points. If I pull that out here, I think I'm going to get like a funny list. We'll see. I have a list within there. What I'd almost like to do is, oh, within each of those different sublists, just go ahead and see is anything within there greater than a certain value. But that's going to get me to a kind of a funny spot. Well. I'm debating, kind of given the time remaining, whether to go there or not. Let me get, I'm going to let me put a pause on this one because I'm going to show something with that custom nodes, which we'll do next time where we can go through and create a function to sort of say what is the average height or what is something like that. Put a pause on that because I actually want to start with a little sun thing a little bit, just get you going on that. So hold that thought about list boolean. Basically, it's going to be just a list of true falses, and we're going to filter things out based on that. But hold that thought for now. Let's get started thinking about the whole issue of sun. Sun's kind of an interesting thing. And, or just really direction relative to anything. And think about how we can sort of consider it. I actually have a little example that'll help us understand it a little bit. But really, when we're starting to think about the sun, and whether things face the sun or don't face the sun, all those things, it all comes down to dot products. OK, it's a little bit of mathematics to sort of figure out whether things face things or not. And let's just go ahead and kind of think about what dot products do for us. Is that true? Actually, I'll take that out for right now. The idea is that as we are working, we can go through and for any panel, anything really, think about it having a normal. So let's say I've drawn a panel here in 3D. You can sort of imagine that being in 3D. There is something to it, okay, which if I came up straight off the panel like that, would be considered the normal to the panel. And it's normal in that it's perpendicular to the panel. So the whole issue is, as we think about panels and we think about vectors that are coming off of panels, really, 
what direction they're facing relative to something else. And when we go through and do dot products, okay, the whole issue there is that based upon the value of the dot product, okay, we'll go through and be able to figure out whether things are facing or not. So, if I actually thought about some point, okay, I'm on this point, and somewhere out here is the sun, or anything I might be pointing at, okay, and I drew another line from the object to the sun. Okay. Here's the idea. When we're working with dot products, if those two vectors are very close to each other, okay, if that angle between them is very, very small, then that's considered to be very direct to the sun. Okay? So, you know, we always go ahead and take a look at that angle right here. And based upon what's going on with an angle in there, if it's a very small angle, okay, at which point it's very acute, we're going to say we're very strongly aligned. Okay? If we, on the other hand, have a vector which does more of this, if I had a vector which was perpendicular to this, okay, that would mean that the panel is, instead of being aligned this way, it's kind of aligned facing away. So if we are perpendicular, what happens is we have a dot product, which is zero between those two different vectors. Okay? And that's an indication that you're perfectly perpendicular to it. You're really getting none of the sun on that particular face. So if you're very close, you get a positive number, if you're facing it, it's acute, and the closer it is to one, okay, you're actually getting stronger and stronger, more and more closely aligned. Okay. On the other hand, you could also be facing away, and that happens too. If you are facing in this direction, and the sun is in that direction, I have now an obtuse angle. Okay. The dot product of those two things is going to be a negative number, okay? And the closer and closer that number gets to minus one, the more and more directly opposed they are from each other. So it all just kind of comes down to dot products. So sort of makes sense? Okay, beautiful. Then let's go and think about how to apply that. If you go out to exploring vector dot products, go ahead and open up example 8.2. We have a teeny tiny little example that will actually get you started thinking about that. So I'll go out to, I'll just open up 8.2. There isn't in this case. So you can just oh. open it. Oh, actually, it's, 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 just in, it's just in Dynamo. Oh. It could just be in any Revit file. So if you want to, just create a new Revit file. <coughs> I never do that to you, do I? But this time we did. Okay, this is a very simple little example. There's not much going on in here. I just really have a couple different vectors drawn right now. What I have right now are a couple lines drawn from an origin. The origin is 0, 0, 0. And I have something called the z-axis, which is just this line pointing straight up. It goes to, it's really 0, 0, 1. And what I'm doing is I'm drawing a vector to it. I'm basically getting the z-axis vector as a point that gets it to 0, 0, 1. I'm drawing a line that goes straight up. So that's what this line is. This line is just basically going through and taking, um, you know, kind of showing that straight axis straight up. I then have some little kind of test vector that I just want to sort of play around with. And in terms of this little test vector, what I'm doing is 
I just have it at kind of like 1, 1 right now. Okay, just sort of in terms of the x and y value, but I'm varying the z value. And you'll see, as you go through and kind of drag this little slider around, there's going to be a little vector that sort of shows up. The kind of closer you get to zero, the more it's just sort of uh, perpendicular it is, the more it's just lying on the ground plane. If you go into negative, it's kind of pointing away. So if I make this like negative five or something like that, that vector is pointing down now. If I make it a very positive number, like 99 or something like that, it'll be pointing up. But what I want you to do is just sort of watch what happens to a dot product between the vector that goes from the start to this value, okay, as well as the vector that's going uh, up in the z-axis. And we're using the vector dot product to it, and really just going through and computing really what the dot product is. So if, for example, you make that zero, okay, where the line is lying perfectly flat on the plane, okay, we have basically a dot product value of zero. If I make it point down into the ground where it's pointing away, so if I make it like minus five, okay, it is a fairly high strong value of going away. If I make it minus one, it is going away, it's going down, but it's not all the way down, okay? So it's partially there to negative one. If I change it on the other hand, I make this a positive number, like 10, then the line is pointing up. There's an acute angle between it and the z vector. Okay? And that's going through and giving us a positive dot product. Okay? And that's the principle we're going to keep on exploiting and using. So let me give you a slight variation of it, and then we'll go for today. And that is, we can go ahead and think about there being a vector to the sun, the sun's location at any particular time we know about. And we can go through and create a vector to it. Okay, so if I draw, for example, a line from, oh, I'll just go from, what is it, the origin, okay, which is right here, kind of to the sun's location, put a line in there. Something is strange there. Let me think about this. Line by start point, end point. Vector is end point. That's the end point. That's the starting point. Oh, it's drawing it there. Why is the sun looking so strange? It must be because the sun's at a funny point in the sky. <laughs> Let's go back and change the sun settings to being something a little bit different. Single day. Let's go ahead, and I think I just have to set it here. Let's do the summer solstice, something like that. Okay, the sun should be pretty high up in the sky. If I go back over to Dynamo, there we go. It has actually some point. There's a point somewhere up in the sky there. You can sort of say it has x, y, z coordinates. I have a line there. So now what happens is if I move my little point here, if it's up close to the sun's vector, okay, this is the sun's vector right now, here's my little line, I get a very positive strong value, so I'm kind of pointing at the sun. If on the other hand, I drag this on down closer to zero, like it's flat, you'll see I'm getting further and further away. I'm starting to create an obtuse angle relative to the sun. If I go ahead and put it uh, like minus 10, I have a very strongly obtuse value. So the closer I get to pointing at the sun, the higher closer to one, the further away I get to sun, the sun is going to be closer to negative one. And if I'm absolutely perpendicular, so there's no sun on my back side or no side on my front side, but this is hitting me directly from the side, and it's zero. Okay, and that's the whole principle we're going to get into. If you want to start playing ahead, open up uh, the next one, which is, I think, 8.3, you'll start to see an example where we have some panels on a surface, and we go through for each panel, put a vector on the surface, a surface normal to the surface, 
and we have a vector to the sun, and we do a cross product, and we can evaluate them all, just sort of see what the strength is. That's where we're going next time, okay? Let us adjourn for the day. Sorry for running over just a little bit, but have a fantastic uh, weekend, I guess. And we will uh, finish up your assignments and start thinking about what we're going to do for the next one, which you might evaluate, uh, imagine is going to take some sort of parametric uh, kind of uh, uh, design and do a little evaluation on it relative to the sun. Okay, let us adjourn.